device opinion. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable CJ, uh, the President of the Supreme Court of Kenya. Uh, every judicial every judicial officer or judge has his style of delivery. Uh, but when there is a, a pressure of time, uh, you elect how to do it, uh, considering the question of time also. The art of brevity does not come or are, are not bestowed on everyone. So you might find that I may take a bit longer on some issues. But to save time also, I may summarize uh, I may give a summary of my findings in some of the issues and only, and also the dispositions on each issue, uh, while in others I, I may give some more elaborate uh, uh, explanation for my conclusion and disposition. The Honorable Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court of Kenya, Honorable Lady Justice Martha Kobe, has in the lead judgment aptly captured the history and background of the appeal, appeals before us. She has also pertinently set out the written and, and oral submissions by all counsel, as well as the embassy, for which I, I thank her on, on our behalf. I see need, no need to replicate or rehash the same. Uh, I've referred to the seven issues which were framed by the court on the 9th of November, 2021. There are seven issues, I'll not read them out. Thank you, thank you. I'll not read them out uh, as uh, they, are, they are already on record and has been, have been referred to by all my colleagues. I'll, I'll also refer to them uh, one after the other. I find myself substantially in agreement with the arguments and conclusions by the Honorable uh, Chief Justice Kome, President of the Court, on some issues. Just as well, on some, on some, I'm of divergent views. I render my opinions and pronouncements on the issues as delineated by the Court. The first question, the first question is uh, regarding the basic structure whether it's applicable uh, in Kenya, and if so, the extent of its application, whether the basic structures uh, of the constitution can only be altered through the primary constitution power and what constitutes the primary power. In answering and determining these questions, I trace the history of what is, a basic, what is the basic structure and what it comprises of in the framework of a constitution. I trace that history globally from the Federal Republic of Germany to India, the US, France, then also to the other countries like Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Bangladesh, Uganda, and many more. Some of these states, particularly uh, the ones which came to consider later the basic structure, some were disinclined initially, they are, uh, they, that's the courts in those countries, but later some of them adopt, adopted and accepted the, the say doctrine. I finally came to the applicability of the say doctrine in, of basic structure to Kenya. I followed our journey of con constitutional making from the CKRC to the Bomas Conference. During the state process, Justice Rigera, as he then was, grappled with the question of the basic structure of our repeal constitution. He concurred with the majority uh, pronouncement in the case of Kesavananda that parliament did not have the power to alter the basic structure of our constitution. This was in the case of Timothy Njoya and others versus CKRC and another. The application of the doctrine arose in the case, also arose in the case of Patrick Ouma Onyango and 12 others versus AG 2008. The court consisting of 
Nyam, Justice Nyamo, Wendo, and uh, Mkule uh, found and declared that the basic steps in constitutional making, they, they declared uh, the basic steps in the constitutional making. Then there was the case of Commission for the Implementation of the Constitution versus National Assembly of Kenya, uh, 2013, where uh, Justice, Honorable Justice Lenola, as he then was, analyzed the question of the basic structure of the Constitution, although that was not uh, really a direct issue, and also uh, he, uh, the issue of its applicability was not before the court. I just want to refer that it was considered uh, and it was, it was a known principle before, before this case, which is before us. Then there was a case of Priscilla and Dululu, uh, Kibuitu, and another versus AG 2015, wherein the three judge bench, Korir, Mumbi, Ngug, Korir, Mumbi Ngugi, and Odunga, held that some amendments under Article 255, one or, or Article 257, can only be done with the involvement of the citizens by way of referendum. They, they, were, they, were, they relied on the sentiments expressed by Honorable Ringera J in the Njoya case. Uh, the three judges, uh, I'll refer to paragraph, to, to what they said, uh, I'll go directly to that, what they said. They say that uh, we agree. We agree with the sentiments expressed by Ringera J in Joya II that an amendment that upsets the basic structure of the Constitution could not be effected by Parliament without involving of the people. In a country like ours, which has a history of disrespect for the sanctity of the Constitution, the jurisprudence propagated in the Joya, in Joya II case was necessary. This may explain why the people of Kenya, aware of the frequent and frivolous amendments to the repealed constitution provided in Articles 255 of the 2010 Constitution, the, uh, and, and I refer to the contents of Article 255, uh, where strict conditions were given for before any amendments uh, uh, could be carried out. And I don't have to refer to that. Uh, uh, it is clear from the above cited provision that there are amendments that can only be done with the involvement of the citizens by way of a referendum of uh, Article 255.1 or popular initiative involving at least one million registered voters, Article 257.1. So it means that uh, the, the judges themselves in this case, referring to the ba basic structure, identified uh, Article 255 as containing uh, uh, principles of the uh, of basic structure. Even where Parliament has been mandated to amend the Constitution, it can only do so after the amendment bill has been subjected to public discussion, Article 256.2. The voice of the people is a voice that cannot be ignored when it comes to the amendment of the 2010 Constitution. We wonder, and we, they continue, we wonder whether in light of the provisions in the in, in 2010 Constitution, the proposition that Parliament cannot amend the Constitution in a manner that may result in the distortion of the basic structure, again, they use the word basic structure, still has a place in our jurisprudence. However, this is not an issue that has been taken up and, 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 and uh, with us, and we will say no more about it. So I'm just giving the background that these uh, issues have been before the court, but not directly. But now, in our case, it is directly before us, and uh, we have to deal with it. Uh, there has been a discussion and contestation of um, uh, whether this basic structure is a doctrine or even a principle. Um, an uncontentious example of popular doctrine, for, inst for instance, 
is that of the separation of powers in a tripartite form of separation comprising the executive, ju uh, judicial, judi ju judiciary, and legislative arms of government. We credit the French jurist with a long name, Charles Louis, Louis de Secondant, Baron de la Bred, uh, at the Montesquieu. I'm not very good in French. Or, in fact, I'm not, I don't know French at all. Uh, or Montesquieu. Uh, or, or read, or I read him in history, simply referred to as Montesquieu, as the father of the doctrine. This doctrine is embedded in our legal system uh, by, di by direct reference uh, in, in various, and, and we have adopted it even in the structure of our constitution. However, even as we make reference to the doctrine of suppression of powers today, it is not to say that the doctrine has not, been, has not evolved since 1748, or that it is only Montesquieu who discussed it. In Kenya, we have not only laws. However, that incorporation was with some modi modification to suit our peculiar circumstances, such as the addition to the independent commis co uh, commissions and offices. Yet in, in do doing so, we have not explicitly provided for it or even define the doctrine of separation of powers in our laws. Still, it is evident that we have applied it. So the question of the basic structure as a doctrine, whether, what is it? Uh, what does it encompass? Does it, uh, uh, is it applicable in Kenya? This is the d duty we have, and uh, we cannot just dismiss, dismiss this. Uh, it is, many times it, it has been said that uh, that this doctrine of basic structure, uh, uh, the ori origin came from the case of uh, Kesavananda, 17, 1973, whereby the majority of seven to six, the court in India, Supreme Court held that the Article uh, 368 of the Indian Constitution does not enable Parliament to alter the basic structure or framework of the Constitution. And, and uh, there's a quotation uh, or, or citation by uh, two judges, uh, Justice Hedge and uh, Justice Mukherjee. Uh, but uh, but uh, after tracing the history, we find that actually these uh, principles did not emanate from India. It emanated uh, uh, from, from the scholar, it, uh, a colleague referred to that, the scholar uh, called, uh, there's a professor Conrad of Germany, he gave us a, a talk uh, in some Indian university, and this idea was captured or was uh, uh, captured by some uh, uh, some lecturers and some professors, and finally it reached the ears of uh, some ju judges who, uh, in the case of uh, Golaknath versus State of Punjab, 1647. Who applied those principles, and, and that was the first foothold in India, uh, that case of Golatnath. Uh, even though the court then did not accept any limitations on Parliament's power to amend the Constitution. So, uh, 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 regarding the, uh, the Germans, it's not easy. It's not easy to see why a German jurist would propagate implied limits to amending the, uh, uh, the constitutional powers. Article 79.3 of the Basic Law of the Federal Republic of Germany, adopted on 8th of May 1949, explicitly bars amendments to provisions concerning the federal structure and to basic principles laid down in, in Articles 1 and 20 on human rights and democratic and social setup. The Germans were healing from the Nazi era, and it's for that reason that the framers of the basic law sought to create a constitution that would, save, that would safeguard against the emergence of either the Weimar Republic's overly fragmented multi-party multi democracy or the Third Reich's authoritarianism. And uh, the, the, there have been arguments uh, in, the, in, in various cases in support of this. Now, uh, in, in France, the same thing happened, uh, where uh, uh, a scholar called Schmidt was uh, uh, 
uh, where the scholar called Maurice Hario, a professor of administrative law and constitutional, constitutional law, published two constitutional treatises, and uh, the difficult name it, it has, I can't read it, setting out the history of implied limits on constitutional amendment. Go now, uh, coming back to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm referring now how this has been discussed in Kenya. Uh, Yaniv Rosna, in his article on constitutional, constitutional amendments, the migration and success of a constitutional idea, uh, the America, in the American Journal of Comparative Law, drew attention to the, de to the debate of the first American Congress. More particularly, the, the debate that took place uh, on August 1789. So there's a lot of discussion in the US, and I, I don't have to go to the cases. Everything is in, in that judgment. I've gone rather into some detail. Uh, legal doctrines and principles are often traceable to a particular school of thought, and more specifically, to a certain scholars who sought to elaborate them. The importance of this is to address the contestation regarding whether the basic, uh, basic structure doctrine was a creature of judicial craft or even whether the courts are capable of creating doctrines. This is not to make a case for incorporation or rather reading into our laws. All doctrines and legal principles are in existence. From this, however, it is evident that the doctrine of basic structure was not invented by the judiciary in India and some of the other countries. Uh, it has been submitted that the doctrine, the, basic, uh, the doctrine of basic structure has yet to gain universal experience. And for that reason, we are asked to find that it is not applicable. I do not think it is necessary that before application of a doctrine of, or legal principle, the same must have universal application. I say this because not all legal doctrines and principles are uni universally uh, are applicable due to the differences in legal systems, such as the civil and common law. This is also because of our, our unique peculiarities, such, such as, states due to, as states due to our historical, cultural, and social systems. My thoughts on this are further fortified by, the, by our constitution, read together with the Judicature Act, Cap 6, Laws of Kenya, which allow us to apply the doctrine that are in line with our laws, more so if they assist us better to interpret and apply them. Uh, so I've, I've, there's a lot of uh, reading uh, material which I've referred to. So basically, directly, is the doctrine. Is the doctrine of basic structure applicable to Kenya? The basic structure of doctrine is not only new to our, is not entirely new to our jurisdiction. Much like the other countries, Kenya has had opportunity to grapple, uh, to grapple with, the, uh, with the doctrine of basic structure in our circumstances. Uh, during our journey of constitutional making, we had the CKRC appointed in November 2000. The commission chaired by Professor Yash Palgai convened the National Con Constitutional Conference for discussion, debate, amendment, and adoption of its report and draft bill, fa famously dubbed the Bomas Conference, due to, uh, due to taking place, uh, or, or which, were, which was taking place at the Bomas. The Bomas Conference was convened and adjourned three times, out of which a draft, a draft was amended and adopted by the acclamation by the conference, sitting in plenary on 23rd March 2003, then handed over the constitution to the Kenya Review Commission. However, before the conference was adjourned, there was a number of challenges to the validity or legitimacy of the entire constitutional review process and uh, its outcome. One of which was the, the case that I've referred to, Timothy Joy and others versus CKRC. Uh, the applicants sought inter alia, that was 2004. The applicants sought inter alia a declaration that certain provisions of the Constitution Review Act transferred, diluted, and vitiated the constitution power of the people of Kenya to adopt a new constitution. The court held that the new constitution needed to be ratified 
through a national referendum as the right to a referendum was a fundamental right of the people in exercise of their constitutional power. Ringera J, who is now retired, who was in the majority, concurred with the pronouncements of Christopher Nanda that parliament did not have the power to alter the basic structure of our constitution. And there's a citation here, which I don't have to re go th through, where just Ringera, and which means our courts, uh, recognized the principle of, uh, in my, this is my submission, principle of uh, basic structure. Uh, application of the doctrine again arose in the case I referred to, Patrick Ouma Onyango. One of the issues that arose was whether parliament in its limited delegated role had the power to debate, alter, or amend the bomber's draft constitution, which was the product of the view of the people. It was also, it was also questioned whether that interference by parliament had the effect of elevating the members of national assembly, uh, assembly above the people of Kenya as sovereigns. The court consisting of Nyamo, Wendo, and Mkule held, and I, I think, uh, I, uh, yeah, I think I should refer to it very quickly. Um, we further find and declare that what, we, that what will give purity to the process is the enactment of the pro pro proposals as a constitution by the people in the referendum. It is the enactment by the people which gives purity and validity. Yes, they are the touchstone the, the touch of validity, the people. The applicants in their final written submissions did concede that constitution power Cannot, cannot be uh, restrained. We exercise judicial power on behalf of the people, and we cannot restrain for them in making their choice. These are three judges of our courts speaking uh, for the people of Kenya. We find and declare that the basic steps in constitution making are one, popular consultations, two, framing of the proposals, three, referendums or uh, constitutional assembly elected and mandated we find the challenge process has satisfied all the three steps. We find and declare that the process is not flawed. In our view, the real judges of the process are the people of Kenya in view of the past involvement with the process as outlined. I'm not going to go through all that. There's a lot of material which I'll, I'll, I'll let you read when you get this, uh, uh, this judgment. Uh, and, and uh, basically, uh, it is to show that Kenya itself, due to, due, due, due to the uh, constitution-making process that led to 2010, uh, people discussed in depth uh, the history and the problems that Kenya went through, the hyper, uh, hyper amendments that we had gone through, and the result was uh, the 2010 constitution and in particular, uh, chapter 16, and uh, articles 255, 256, 257, which uh, I, I will be persuading you in, in this, in this uh, uh, opinion that contains the basic structure uh, that, that uh, supposed to protect uh, the people from amendments by even the delegated uh, power, which is uh, parliament. Uh, in the, after the promulgation of the constitution in August 2010, there was the case of the Commission for the Implementation of the Constitution versus National Assembly of Kenya, where the National Assembly, by the Constitutional Amendment Bill 2013, sought to amend Article 260 of the Constitution in respect of the de definition of state, state office. Uh, I, I'd already discussed that. Then there was the case of uh, uh, Priscilla uh, Kibuitu. Uh, then we have uh, uh, various cases. Uh, Attorney General versus Randu Nzai, uh, whereby the court held that in view of the foregoing, the appellant's contention that the respondent's agenda of succession is unconstitutional, has no basis in law. The respondents have a constitutional right to demand succession but that can only be done within the conference of the Constitution as stipulated under Articles 255, 256, and 257 of the Constitution. Now, 
In all these cases, the applicability of the basic structure doctrine was not a substantive question of the courts. Uh, the, the courts were asked to determine, unlike the present one. So in this case, uh, through my proposals here, which I, I, I don't wish to, to go through, and I, I have told you the, uh, the art of brevity is, is not donated to everybody, uh, and I'm not one of them. So I'll let, I'll let you read. Uh, but I would say, I'd refer to uh, what I've said here. That, uh, that there, there was this decision by Justice Mativo in the Third Alliance case, Kenya versus another versus head of public service, Joseph Kinyua, and others versus Martin Kimani and others. Uh, in that case, Mativo, Justice Mativo, uh, said, uh, uh, he, he, he referred to this doctrine and he stated as follows. The command in Article 259 is instrumental in, in shaping the constitutional jurisprudence in this country. Call it by any name, basic structure, or whatever. But Article 259 provides the manner in which the constitution is to be interpreted to maintain its fabric, which cannot be dismantled by any authority created by the uh, constitution itself, be it the parliament, the executive, or the judiciary. Uh, couched, uh, couched in this doctrine are a few crucial aspects. Uh, first, that uh, constitutions are considered to be, the, to be the act of the people as the, the almighty sovereign. We see this as the power of the, of the people recognized and documented, documented in the preamble of our constitution, which begins as follows, and I quote, we the people of Kenya exercising our sovereign and inalienable right to determine form of government of our country and having participated fully in the making of the constitution. So I've gone through this and I invited you, as uh, some of the, my colleagues have, have said, some of our ju judgments are alone. Mine is 125 and uh, it is, I would not uh, wish to read through it. I invite you to read uh, carefully, but uh, after going through all my arguments uh, and citing various cases and showing the historical uh, road we passed to acquire, uh, to, to get this very important uh, uh, constitution, 2010, of which I'm, I'm sure all of us are proud of and all, are, all of us cherish, I came to the conclusion of uh, my disposition on this issue, first issue, noting our history, context, and constitutional text, I find that the doctrine of basic structure is uh, applicable to Kenya. Uh, uh, further, that the basic structure of a constitution can only be altered or denatured through the primary constituent power. Uh, C, it's my further finding that the primary constitution power is the unbound power of the people to make or unmake constitution and genuine exercise of the same uh, of the same can be identified by the four sequential steps of civic education, public participation, uh, constitution assembly, plus referendum. So I've set out in the, uh, in the judgment what uh, the basic structure entails. And I've set out, and I've discussed the issue, where, uh, 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 can the basic structure of the constitution only be altered through primary constitutional power and what constitutes the primary power. I've discussed that, and that was my dispensation. So that is my dispensation in that question, and I invite you to read that. So in the interest of brevity of time, I'll go to another issue. Uh, issue number two. Issue number two whether the president can initiate changes, amendments to the constitution, and whether constitutional amendment can only be initiated by parliament through a parliamentary initiative under the Article 256 of the constitution, or through a popular initiative under the Article 257 of the constitution. I'll, deal, I'll give a summarized uh, view of this, which is contained in this uh, uh, opinion and judgment, and also one more issue. The other issue is um, 
the other issue, the place of public, issue number five, the place of public participation under Article 10, vis a vis the role of IBC. Uh, the other three, I, I wish just to, 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 set, to set out and read and, and, uh, and state my disp disposition without going into uh, the details, and I leave that uh, to you to read when you have the time. Uh, regarding uh, question two, Gatengu J, J. A. rightly observed that Article 257 makes no qualification of who may or may not promote a popular initiative, and there is no explicit bar against any person, including the president, from promoting a constitution amendment by popular initiative. It is therefore upon the court to interpret and determine the parameters of the same. Now, uh, Justice Tuyot uh, gave uh, the historical context of, uh, uh, of highlighting the genesis of popular initiative, uh, the clauses in the Constitution. This can be traced uh, back to the CKRC final report, where the Commission noted that although the conference agreed the process of constitutional amendment, this must not be left entirely to Parliament. Different options needed further thought, particularly with regard to the exact modalities of engaging the constituent power of the people. The Commission, in addressing the issue, recommended that the cit that citizen and the civil society may initiate constitutional amendments through a process called popular initiative. This was then captured in the zero draft at Article 346, and the same was retained in the BOMA's draft as follows. And I quote, an, amend, an amendment to this constitution may be proposed by popular in initiative signed by at least one million citizens uh, to vote. So the, the, the genesis of the issue of popular initiative was way, way back during the CKRC conferences. The same survived in Naivasha, uh, the Naivasha Accord of November 2004 and the Kilifi Accord of June 2005. Uh, and also, it was retained in the harmonized draft. The objective for the popular initiative as captured by the final report of the technical working group of uh, Group K of the Constitution of, of Kenya Review Commission on Constitution of Commission and Amendments to the, to the Constitution held, held up to the creation of 2010 Constitution, the report said a committee in, introduced a novel idea called popular initi initiative. This is an innovative where the citizen can only own motion uh, by their own motion initiate amendment to the constitution by way of a popular initiative, either in the form of a general suggestion or a formulated draft bill. The committee explained that the intention was a starting point towards curbing dicta dictatorship by parliament. Um, to your J.A. went to hold that the contrary to the AG's submission that the the intention of the popular in the initiative was to curb parliamentary monopoly for both people and state organs. The historical perspective demonstrated that the popular initiative was a preserve of the, of the citizens. It's for this reason that I concur with Kiyage J when he concluded that the popular initiative route must be citizen-conceived, citizen-initiated, initiated, and citizen-driven process, and the citizens are the ordinary people whether as individuals or as organized civil groups. The, regarding the assertion that the president can initiate pr process of constitutional amendment by way of, of popular initiative in his capacity as a private citizen, two pertinent uh, uh, issues arise. First is the fact that Article 257.5 subscribes the president a role in the amendment process. Article 257.5 provides that if a bill to, the, to amend the Constitution proposing an, an, an amendment relating to, to matters under Article 255, the President shall, before assenting to the bill, request IBC to conduct a national referendum within 90 days. The import of this provision is it assigns the President the power to decide whether or not to hold a referendum. To ensure the integrity of the process of constitutional amendment pursuant to Article 257, we cannot have the President playing the role of umpire, who is expected to be neutral 
and act in the interest of, of the nation in a process where he's also a player advocating for his own personal interests and agendas. Clearly, there would be a serious conflict of interest. This would be detrimental to the interests of the people and the nation. Second is that the president ceases to be an ordinary citizen the minute he takes office. Article 131 describes him as the head of state and government who exercises ex executive authority of the republic. He's also the commander in chief of the Defense Kenya Forces. He chairs the National Security Council pursuant to Article 240, which exercises supervisory control over national security organs, including the Kenya Defense Forces, the National Intelligence Service, and the National Police Service. He is also the symbol of national unity. He plays the various powerful roles pursuant to Article 132, including appointing cabinet secretaries, attorney general, principal secretaries, high commissioners, ambassadors, as well as diplomatic and consular representatives. He is empowered by virtue of Articles 132, 4, 2D, 2, 4D, and E to declare a state of emergency or declare war, respectively. He may also, pursuant to Article 192, even suspend county governments, either in emergency arising out of, out of internal conflict or war for any other exceptional uh, circumstances. By virtue of holding this, this office, the president is accorded immunity with Article 143. So you can see the, the special position of the president. And we are saying, and uh, I'm saying that um, the president cannot act as a promoter or initiator, or even if you have to use that name, initiator, initiator uh, he cannot uh, uh, commence or get involved. In this particular case, there is evidence that not only, not, not only did he start the process, but he was also involved throughout, and all steps taken by others was, uh, was uh, the, the genesis was his own actions through the Gazette notice and the legal uh, steps that he, he, talk, he took. Uh, the, this power and control the president, that the president exercises by virtue of his position was evident in the inception of the amendment bill as rightly pointed out by the learned judges of the superior courts. Right from the handshake, that was between him as the elected president, president following the contentious 2017 general elections and rerun and his competitor and challenger, Honorable Raila Odinga, he then proceeded to appoint that. So I give, uh, in this uh, narration, give, give, I give the history of all the steps and, and that he was involved in directly, um, uh, in the build, build, building bridges to a united Kenya from a nation of blood ties to a nation of, of ideals, uh, the, the, the appointment of the, of the teams, uh, the Gazette notices throughout each, the first step had a domino effect, and throughout he was, he was involved, and the government's role was, was also, was also uh, very clear. The difference in the amendment bill that was launched on 25th November 2020 from the amendment bill contained in the BBI Steering Committee report presented to the President on 26 2020 are bet, better contextualized uh, uh, in discussing the place of uh, public participation under issue number five. Uh, now, so I, uh, my conclusion there is that uh, my, my, that uh, on whether the president can initiate a, a, a popular initiative to amend the constitution under, under article 257, it, it is my finding that he cannot. Uh, issue number three, on whether the second schedule to the Constitution of Kenya uh, Amendment Bill 2020 was unconstitutional, I find that on issue number three, I find that the second schedule of the, of the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill to, be to have been unconstitutional. Um, on question number four, uh, it is my finding that pursuant to Article 143 2, 2, no civil proceedings can be instituted against the president or person performing the functions 
of the office of the president during their tenure of office with regard to anything done or not done contrary to the Constitution. And uh, regarding pu public participation, uh, I, I wanted to say more, but I will wish to save time, and I, want, I will invite you to, to, read the, uh, uh, to read the judgment. On issue number five, I find that by the time the process was stopped by the High Court, the public participation undertaken was not sufficient reasonable or meaningful. Issue number six, I find that the IBC was not properly composed or quoted while it undertook the verification of signatures, first one to Article 257.4 of the Constitution. However, in the light of the decision in Isaac B. Watt case, IBC's undertakings in compliance with the decision were lawful. Number seven, it is my finding that the interpretation of Article 257.10 uh, on whether the proposed amendments should be submitted to the people as separate but distinct referendum questions, uh, this issue was not ripe, it was not ripe for determination uh, by, uh, to, for determination. On the, on the issue of costs, I recommend that being a public interest matter, uh, the parties ought to bear their own costs of proceedings in the High Court, Court of Appeal, and in the, and in the present appeals. Uh, the final orders of this court are, 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 are as will be contained in the lead judgment of the Chief Justice and the President of the Court, uh, and which he will uh, advise uh, the, uh, the court uh, before we, 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 we end these proceedings. I've had to do this but I invite you, please, carefully read my whole judgment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Ibrahim Mohammed. Allow me now to invite.